<clears throat> bios never really sound like you at all. Like you always wonder who, who wrote them. I'm like, I like cupcakes. And that never makes it into a bio. Um, so just to kind of set the, the stage of what I'm going to be doing, I'm literally doing a brain dump of kind of what I've been exploring the last year. Um, so there's a lot of like links and things and that kind of stuff. I have a whole URL you can follow after. Um, but I, I really wanted to start today off with a, a story and kind of think about the idea of the theme of FITC today. And so, um, so this is me as a kid, and I don't think I've changed. Um, but my dad likes to tell this story, so I'm going to share it with you. And when I think about coming into the light, I think this is kind of a story about that, and you'll see how it transitions a little bit. So are you with me? Yeah? You want to hear maybe too much personal information? <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, so when I was three, uh, I had two, so I've always had two older brothers, not just when I was three. But I have two older brothers, Darren and Corey, and um, I grew up... Uh, you know, my mom worked very hard. My dad also worked very hard. My brothers took care of me a lot of the times. And so we lived on a crescent. And uh, you know, our house was right on the crescent, and we had tons of kids in our neighborhood. And so, you know, I was riding my tricycle when I was three, and everyone was playing in the, the crescent. And, you know, all the, all the kids are kind of playing street hockey, as you do. Um, and I'm quite a bit younger than the rest of these kids. Um, and so... I'm riding my tricycle around, I'm riding my tricycle around, and all of a sudden there's just this look of horror on every kid's face, and I, I don't understand it. Like, what? You know, and I just keep riding my tricycle around, and I'm going around, and they're going the other way, and I'm going around, and they're going the other way. So they're basically keeping this far distance from me, and so I keep trying to, you know, circle around them and catch up, and I couldn't understand what the horror was. Well, the horror was is that I shit my pants. Right? As you do when you're three. I, I had an accident and, uh, you know, I didn't stop riding my bike. So I was riding my bike, riding my bike, and everyone's just like, you know, my brother is like disowned me at age five. And we're riding my bike and all of a sudden my brother disappears and gets my dad. So I see my dad, he comes out and he's running. And literally, they pull me up, like they back me up onto our sidewalk, like beep, 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 trying to keep a distance, you know, backing up my tricycle so I can't, you know, play, or play on it or, or bike anymore. And my dad lifts me up and kind of does one of these and puts me in the garage and tells me not to move, you know, and they get a hose. You can kind of imagine the scene, right? I think I'm kind of laying it out a little. Um, and my mom, I can hear my mom uh, the door opens to the basement, and I can hear my mom, you know, like, what, like, what happened, you know? I mean, I was, I was trained at an early age, and my brothers were taking care of me. Like, where did she go wrong, basically? Like, what happened? And my dad was like, you know, she, she just didn't care. Like, you know, shit happens, and she just kept going, right? Like, she just didn't care. And my dad always says that, you know, that's the age where he realized kind of, like, who I was going to be right? Like, I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, you know, uh, you got a load in your pants, um, you know, and, but I didn't care because I, you know, basically had already just emptied out. And he says, you know, at that age, kids around five or so, you kind of see their personality and this is your personality. You're just going to keep on going and, and you're going to kind of go and discover and do things even when people are looking at you a little, a little oddly. Um, so that theme of maybe... Uh, TMI might come back a little bit, um, hopefully in, in kind of a delightful way. But I hope that you can kind of imagine, you know, that idea of, you know, sometimes stuff happens and you just carry it with you <laughs> if you have to, um, because it's part of that journey of where you're going to. And so when I think about the biggest kind of accolade I ever got, this is my dad maybe a couple months ago, and my dad's like, you know, here's a book. Um, he's like, oh, I'm reading this book. It's really good. Has anyone read this book? Yeah, apparently it's really good, says my dad. Um, and I'm like, oh, I heard it's good. And he's like, I thought you wrote it, right? And it's called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, right? Um, and so for me, I was like, holy crap, Lincoln, it's got nothing on this. So we're going to kind of progress into the story of, of maybe about a year ago and where I started and kind of where I've been. 
And so this is uh, all the resources or anything I'm going to talk about is going to be at this URL. I have a long, long list of things that are going on. So about a year ago, I changed um, right about, actually, FITC is really interesting for me this way. I feel like I always make a major decision every couple years at an FITC, whether it's something I want to do or it's a job offer. It's always right before. So this time last year, um, I was debating on whether or not I moved from New York to Vancouver uh, to take this job. And the job that was offered to me was to be um, kind of like the the the... They call it a program manager, but it's basically, I run a maker space, right? Um, and I have a bunch of tooling, and uh, I'm not given a lot of definition, which is a little weird. So I was debating on doing that. And so in the first week when I decided to take that job, this was one of my, I guess if you want to call them clients, my first clients. Um, you know, I think we know who he is. Everyone seems to love him. Um, you know, even babies love him. Pandas love him. Obama for sure loved him, you know, uh, the internet loved him. Um, and one of the first things is when we opened up Microsoft Vancouver, they said we need to give a present. But they didn't give me any parameters, which is kind of, oh, like, do you guys know what you're getting into? <laughs> like, you gave me no parameters, we need to give them something. And so, uh, you know, first week in the job, I'm gifting um, the prime minister, uh, you know, our mayor, um, the premier, uh, some skateboards that we had. Uh, you know, I worked with an artist out of Ottawa named Ram Kanda, and we'd worked together and got these laser engraved and were able to give them. And it was like something that people were like, hmm, oh, Microsoft? What? Um, you know, uh, I'm not quite sure that Christy Clark is using it. Um, that's okay. She didn't seem super impressed by it, but what else? Um, and then in my next couple months in the job, uh, I had this guy visit, um, and, uh, you know, they say Bill Gates is going to be in your space, and you're like, oh, my God, uh, like, richest guy in the world is going to be around me, one of the biggest philanthropists in the world, you know, is uh, going to be in my space. Um, so I hastily, like, went into processing and pulled an image up and kind of color blocked it and then pulled it into Illustrator and tweaked it and then laser cut it and reassembled all this stuff. I thought it was a great idea about 4 o'clock the day before the visit and about 4 a.m. I was, like, cursing my previous self, right? And I put this together and I wasn't sure about it and they hung it up and I was really scared. So I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. When you're close to something, you don't know if it's good or not. I still don't know, but he's in my space and he's near it, you know, and I'm like, ooh, this is getting good. Um, and then uh, we had a big reception and I'm sitting there eating and all of a sudden, imagine that you're having a conversation, imagine something totally mundane, right? Like, oh yeah, I tried this new detergent, I'm not allergic to it, it's awesome. You know, and you're, you got like some kind of like fancy thing you're shoving in your face, right? Because you haven't eaten all day. And you look to the right, and like Bill Gates is ghosted in on your conversation, like all cash, right? Like, hey, what's up? Hey, Bill. <laughs> like, holy shit, right? So, you know, I look over and there he is, and I can't say anything. And my mouth is half full and stuff's falling all over my chest because... I mean, let's just face it, a chest is just a bib for food. And I look over and I'm like, hey, I made something in your likeness. Uh, it's over there. Please don't fire me. So our PR person steps in and kind of does like a little like, hey, I need to fix the situation. This is Stacy. She runs the makerspace here along with a lot of our creative uh, kind of coding initiatives. You know, she created something. You'll see it tomorrow when you tour, et cetera, et cetera. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. And I'm just like, I'm getting fired. Like, I kept tapping my badge, like, am I fired yet? Am I fired yet? Um, and then I think probably after 10 years, 15 years of working in the industry, working for clients like Coca-Cola or McDonald's or, you know, that, that client list that everyone at some age thinks is such an amazing thing to have, um, I think this is probably my favorite moment in my career. Uh, he didn't sit on the right side. He should be looking at it. Um, you know, I'm not going to art direct this. But I think for me, this was probably one of those moments where I was like, screw the dot com, screw some of this other stuff. Like, I actually made something, started it with code, put it together, and this is the result of it. 
And so that's kind of how my first couple months started off in my job. And so, you know, I'm off to a quick start and then, oh, right? Because I have the reality of this job and the reality is that I need to kind of figure out a way to connect with engineers. And so, you know, that moment when they connect and, and you get your point across or you teach them something and they don't expect it is kind of like this, <laughs> right? You don't have a lot of faith in it, and you're just like, whoa. So, you know, when I think about, um, you know, what I need to do, and I think about tinkers, the word tinker, it actually kind of has a really bad connotation, because you kind of think of tinkers as people who kind of just play with things, and it's not going to go anywhere, right? But I like to think of tinkers as people who are super inquisitive, right? Like, what is that? And then, oh, God, that's that, right? And I also like to think of tinkers as people who, you know, Maybe smart and lazy, right? People who want to find the quickest way to do something. And so maybe tinkers are incurable. And, you know, I like to think about these things because in my everyday job, if there's one thing I'm mandated to do, it's I'm mandated to make people think and act differently. Right? And it sounds such a weird thing. Like, imagine that's on your job card. What does that even mean? Right? And some people like to put the word culture change against it. And to me, that kind of grosses me out a little. Um, but my job is to help everyone who works there and externally see that it's not narrow, it's wide, and there's so many things we could look at and so many things we can play with. Um, and I'm kind of kindling for that. And so I'm going to go over some of the things that we've been using and playing with um, in hopes that maybe uh, you too will go home and think about you know, hey, maybe I do web design all day long, but maybe I should be looking at robotics just to play with it. Or like, hey, you know, I hear a lot about uh, VR, how do I get started? Or those kind of things. And so my goal here is that maybe you just take something away and put it in your everyday. And so, you know, when you think about corp life, or my corp life, working at Microsoft, it's kind of what you imagine it probably to be somewhat. Um, you know, my first two uh, years working at Microsoft, I did this because someone replied all to a really big distribution list and almost took down all our entire email um, system. So I often think this is what we get stuck in. And I'm coming from the opposite area where I have to teach engineers how to appreciate art, that creativity is in a place, that, you know, uh, that everything that they're doing comes back to them tenfold, right? And so often when I talk about creative coding, this is what they think of. Right, a lot of the engineers, like they think of that old turtle you used to move around on the screen with commands. And so creativity for people who don't inherently have that instilled in them as their every day, they see it as a different word. It's a lot like working with people like that, right? Like why would I do that? Why do I need to do these things? Um, so I get a lot of that. I love you. Um, but really, at the end of the day, my goal is to kind of think or show people that there are several ways to get to the same kind of problem. Um, and I need to change that. <laughs> I'll use this for everything. I wish it was my profile. So where I work is called, it's in Vancouver, it's called The Garage. Um, it's uh, it's a very much a maker space. Uh, we have all your makerish tools, 3D printers and CNC mills and all that good stuff. And um, not only do I have to know all that stuff, I also have to be able to code alongside people. I have to show them the newest APIs. I have to teach them about all the different technologies that Microsoft doesn't have, all the technologies we have. So it's kind of a weird thing, because a lot of people see me as a coder with a glue gun for some reason. Um, and I gotta teach them that it's okay to kind of like try something and fail, right? Which they're not allowed to do in their job, right? Because failure, can be success, depending on how you look at it. For this guy, that's not, not well, not too bad, right? And for them, I also got to talk about celebrating success that's not your own, right? <laughs> so you spend so much time working on your own career that you celebrate your successes, but now I'm starting to celebrate everyone else's, which I think is so awesome. So this is what my space looks like. Um, this is close-up shot, it's fairly big. And this is not what you would expect from a Microsoft Office. It looks entirely different. And it's as soon as you walk in, it's kind of the gem. And so 
Not only that, everything, if you look in the space, everything I make, I try to instill our personality and bring something different to it so that people kind of change their, their mindset a little. And so, you know, I did this series, and people in the office were snatching them up, and I brought some of these pens. But I was making fun of our culture. You know, like, hey, you, you, you do adequate work. You know, like, it's okay. Um, you know, you committed without comments. Right? So they're kind of like shame badges. All right? And then you'd see people walking around the office, and it's like, I made it pop. And you'd be like, yeah, you did. You made that pop. Right? And so, you know, or like, thanks for showing up, like that kind of thing. And just embracing a sense of humor. Right? And so starting to just do this all the time, every single day, making things like, sorry, we're open. Can you get any more Canadian than that? Right? And then also just starting to show them that there's different ways that they could be looking at things. Making pixel art with, uh, with code or, you know, doing some cushions that they don't expect. Or like, hey, for the Game of Thrones nerds, taking that Hod uh, Hodar joke and making it, like, for real. So, like, hold the door, you know? So, and then also bringing a different flavor to what we have day to day. And bringing kids in, for example, that they can go and mentor and teach. And, uh, you know, showing them the one kid right there in the stripes, he's going to be all your boss. His name's Morgan. He's incredibly intelligent. Um, he just took to, like, everything like you could imagine. You know, or we hosted creative mornings, and I brought in um, a Japanese calligrapher. And that's not something you would expect in our space. And then I get them to do things like, has anyone seen the Pinterest? Like, I try this on Pinterest, and here's the, what actually happened. So we have, like, a, a night where we do that, and people choose different things. And so these are supposed to be those nice, like, weave kind of um, hangings you put on your wall, and that's what we ended up with. But we celebrate it, right? Or, you know, getting people to fill out surveys for me or do things, and I'm going to give them ice cream because I know that's much more fun, especially if there's an ice cream truck and a jingle. Right? But you start to see that it changes culture a little bit. And so you start to see that, you know, people start 3D printing stuff. You give them perler beads, the first thing they make is a poop emoji. This, this was this guy's first 3D print. Um, you can probably deduce what he's got on there. You know, I kind of turned a blind eye to that. But it resulted in him learning, you know, the resin printer and doing that. And so one of the things I try to distill a lot is the law of the instrument. And that's the idea that you don't only have one tool. Right? So if everything looks like a nail, then you're just going to basically have a hammer. I don't, wanna, I don't want people to be like, the only language I know is C-sharp, or the only language I know is JavaScript, or this is the only approach I want to know. We made that mistake back in the days of Flash, right? And I want people to think about, it's just how do you get there? There's so many ways to do that. And for a lot of them, it's about the idea of embracing not knowing, you know, what are those things. And it's not always picking up the greatest, latest technology. And for some of them, too, when they're not comfortable in this area, it's, you know, programming like this, changing stuff and seeing what happens. How many people program like this? There's no shame in it. Deconstruction of something is one of the most amazing ways to learn something from it. Variations and beautiful accent, accidents, right? And so some of this I've learned is that you need to sometimes let people learn it on their own, right? Because they're going to assume that they come with these things, and when you're trying to add new tools into their toolkits, that's what you need to do. So I'm going to segue into some of the technologies that we're kind of, you know, going on. Yeah, that one's not so great. But the segue is a good one. So we have an AR, VR, MR room. Yes, I said all of it together. I call it future reality, right? And so we have a room devoted um, to that. And we have the ability for anyone to come in and create on any of those platforms. It's not just about us and the HoloLens. And so we embrace things like, can we do narratives with 360 cameras? Uh, we have the Vive, the Oculus, um, you know, all those kind of setups, green screen, everything that someone can come in and play. Um, you know, and even, you know, some people who don't work on the HoloLens day to day are interested in coming in and starting to make something on it. One of the things I've been teaching for some of these people internally and externally is HoloJS, which is the ability to create HoloLens apps with JavaScript. Right? And there's, this is a really great one. It's a mixed reality framework that's based on that. 
And so you can start to use JavaScript to create those things. And so we start to look at all these kind of open source and frameworks for all sorts of technologies. Um, this is hollow art and um, its ability to kind of, you know, draw with those gestures. Not totally groundbreaking, but you start to see all these different kind of ways that you can do it. And then you start to see that VR is being used in a bunch of different ways. Um, advertising agencies. This is an old one, but it's the idea of future reality as just a part of the experience, not the experience itself, which I think is really interesting. So this is a company who they sell basically, I think it's like hot chocolate or hot coffee, and they create this experience where you're immersed in VR, but the physical experience around it supports it. And so you'll start to see that, like for me, this is where I think it's interesting, and this is what we're playing with a little bit. How do you control physical objects from these things? into this trailer, right, and they set you up, and really all you're getting is a sample at the end. <laughs> kind of smart. I'm curious if she went in the trailer. So this is what I think is cool, and again, this isn't groundbreaking now, nowadays. But they're simulating the physical experience in your virtual. You're getting the air blown in your face, right? They turn down the, the they crank the heat down, baking snow, right? You're on this creaky bridge. And for me, I find this stuff super interesting. All to get this cheap sample of coffee or extreme lactate. somewhere for you, right? I mean, whatever, but I like the things that they put around it. Because you're not thinking of VR anymore as this item where you're experiencing only in here, right? So when we look at those kind of things, I mean, th that's what I find interesting, especially when it comes to the future realities, the ability to take those experiences and elevate them um, past that headset. And so, uh, you know, we started setting stuff up in our VR room so that we could green screen and show what's happening in the user experience and do some um, compositing on top of that. Uh, we, and I look at that, and it makes it much more interesting because then you can start to tell stories like this. You know. This is like my dad, I swear. My dad would be like, what's this do? I don't know, right? But even for user testing, you can start to see where, what are they struggling with? What are they doing, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, put your helmet back on, right? Um, and we start to look to other places for inspiration. And so uh, Fluid Interfaces, um, the lab from MIT, they have some really interesting, just like prototypical kind of uh, interaction that they do a lot with VR and MR and, and AR. And so we look to places like this for some kind of inspiration. Um, you know, looking at how can we bring this back to an idea that someone might have. And again, we're not tied to our platform in my area. That's what I love about it. It's open. And so, uh, one of the things that we did is we created a, we had one guy who was crazy about VR games and he gave me this big map that was done in, I don't know if it was Chartley or out of one of those things. It looked awful. And then we kind of put this out. So if you ever wanted to play a game um, on the HTC uh, Vive or Oculus or whatnot um, in VR, this would be your, your map. So if you're interested in this by any chance, just let me know. I have a PDF of it. You can print it out. 
You know, and then we started looking at all the things you need to do when you're thinking about research and development for VR, AR, MR. You know, things like where do you get covers? Because does anyone have a VR headset at their office? Does anyone have to share that headset? Gross, right? Like you don't realize how much people sweat. Gross, is all I can say. So we, you know, where can you buy covers and what's the hygiene process that you need for that? We have these covers too and they're quite funny because people really don't know what to do with them, right? And so it's that idea that they're so uncomfortable that once they put it in, there's just that leveling ground and there's nothing better for someone to think openly than being completely like not familiar with anything, including the process and hygiene. And so uh, we look at WebVR quite a bit now and is WebVR ready, for example, it's a great site that'll tell you, you know, which browsers is it supported in and how you can use it. And some of the frameworks we've been playing with, we've been doing, has anyone done A-Frame? Okay, so if you're looking into web VR, A-Frame's an awesome way to get started. Super, super quick. And so we look at, you know, building these things uh, very, very quick just to get an idea out. Just the spiking of an idea. And maybe holding on to it or iterating or maybe letting go of it too. Um, you know, and then we start to look, if you look online now, you'll start to see that if you don't believe VR is here, and I've heard it in many talks, it is. And you're starting to see design studios or, uh, you know, a software specifically made for it. People are starting to do UX talks for future reality, and that's really when you know it's hit, right? Because now, experience, experience, and now the user is coming into it. And so, you know, you're starting to see those things. Um, you know, and you're starting to see really unique uses of it. Uh, notes on blindness is basically VR is to give a sense um, of what it might be like to be um, in that situation. And so now when we think about VR, we move on to fabrication for us. And fabrication is often about machines and software. Um, I work with engineers who work with their hands, their hands are their livelihood, and uh, I've seen some really crazy things. Like, you should not hold, hold a saw that way, my friend. You know, I actually told an engineer that. You shouldn't probably hold a saw that way. What do you know? All right, buddy. Let's watch this, <laughs> you know. Let's see what happens. Um, and so you, it's this crazy feeling if you've never picked up a tool and you've never used these things before. To, once you start to do it, people start to work. I truly believe they start to work and think differently. And so some of the tools that we look at, um, how many people have played with the CNC before? Right? So ability to kind of like carve out. Uh, sometimes it's on X, Y, Z. So you might put a big sheet of plywood and you might carve something out from a design. So you might do something as simple as FITC up on the wall, all the way to creating uh, furniture. Um, you know, if you can do another access, which is often called fourth access, uh, you can start to carve out like, you know, trophies and things like that. So one of the things that uh, I got, we have a bunch of them, but I got uh, an X carve from Inventables, which is really easy to use. Um, and it allows you to, you know, take something that you've done and just quickly prototype it out. We also have a desktop CNC, um, which is really great for PCBs and jewelry called another mill. Um, and these are fabrication technologies that are older. People sometimes go to a college for a machinist kind of um, degree or, or certificate. Um, and they're coming more and more popular and more and more accessible. Years and years ago, 3D printers were super expensive and more and more accessible. So you're going to hear more about these things. You can get this, uh, I think this is on Kickstarter, and it's 500 bucks, and it can do 4 by 8 sheet of plywood and it's suspended so it's really different because normally you see and see it's top down and so this one's suspended. One of the things that we're looking at in the future is called Shaper and so Shaper is you put down this tape and you send it your design and you kind of guide it. It kind of just goes with it and you hold it and support it. Um, so you're starting to see that that is such a small little machine so everything's getting more and more powerful and smaller and more accessible. We do a lot of 3D printing. One of the things that we're doing a lot is resin printing. And so we use something called a Formlabs. And this does really high quality um, prints. And, and you, know, you can get anything. I mean, a lot of dental places use it, for example. And you're starting to see people create, like I showed you that dinosaur head, which they just ripped off the internet. Thank you, internet. 
That dinosaur head is literally a shower head, so a dinosaur is always screaming at you when you're showering, which is kind of awesome, right? Um, but 3D printers have gone down significantly in price, and so you can start to buy ones that you put together or even pre-configured and calibrated for well under $1,000, and they work with a lot of the software that you're using. Uh, you know, something like a, a water jet um, cutter, you know, not approachable five years ago, now you're starting to see something like Wazer that's coming out, um, you know, $5,000 mark US, uh, you know, whether it's going to be good or not, I don't know, but you're starting to see these things, and then you're starting to see these tools online that are being made for you. So MakerCase is a, a great website where you just plug in the width, height, and everything that you need, and it'll make boxes for you. So now people can easily fabricate stuff, and they have no excuse. They don't even necessarily need to use a, a tool in between. They can create the PDF for them. And one of the things I like to do in the space is I like to curate analog and then digital. And so I brought in an old school knitting machine. And one of the most, uh, I think, who's done the most interesting work with it is a, a woman out of uh, New York City, uh, Mariko Kosaka. Um, and she uh, has done a lot of stuff with knitting machines, beautiful, beautiful work, written programs for them, like highly technical. I love her work. Um, and then I realized that they have on the market, um, I think it's called Knitterate. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. And it's going to be available. This is uh, on Kickstarter. And so you could send any design you want to be knitted and fabricated, right, with up to those many colors. And so your output is no longer the web. It's no longer the browser. You can start to create these interesting artifacts from various kinds of input. And so I find that super fascinating. I warned you there'd be a lot of links, right? And so we often look at electronics. If you don't know what to make for a Halloween costume, that is really easy and effective. It's just EL wire. Um, and when we look at electronics for us, electronics is super interesting for a lot of you. How many people here do JavaScript or are familiar with it at least, right? So JavaScript, I think, this is a natural, if you haven't touched Arduino or Raspberry Pi or any of those things, I feel like this is a natural thing for you to progress into to take experiences beyond the browser because JavaScript, you can easily use your knowledge and work with these devices, right? And the learning curve is getting smaller and smaller. And so, you know, we can look at something like uh, there's Pocket Chip, for example. Has anyone heard of Pocket Chip? Get Chip? So, you know, for 70 bucks, it comes with like an old retro console, or you can get, uh, you know, 16 bucks or so, and it comes with Wi Fi. Has anyone heard of the micro bit? Micro bits are now available on Adafruit. You can order them, they're about 16 bucks. I sound like a commercial, you're welcome. And these were produced by the BBC um, in the UK, and they were given to every kid in the fifth grade, and they wanted to teach them how to code. And you can code through the browser. Uh, with this item, it plugs into your USB. It's like, if you can think of Arduino, it's similar, right? But it has Bluetooth, and it has an accelerometer. And you can program it using something like Scratch, it's called Blocky, or you can use JavaScript, or you can use Python, right? So we were showing this at Maker Faire last year, and this is what one of the eight-year-olds came up and wrote, and it's just like basically scrolls this. And I was like, oh, existential, dude. You're too young for that. Right? What is life? And this is constantly scrolling on this little item. Right? But these items are kind of becoming more and more accessible. And this is one of the developers on the project, thanks, who, you know, again, I saw him build this in like 10 minutes. It was very, very easy. Just using uh, the sensitivity of the light and the distance from his hand to cover that up and then creating tones based on that. Uh, you can spend, you know, two, three bucks or up to about seven, eight and get a ESP8266. And again, Wi-Fi connected. Create your own garage opener, right? Create something at work that shows a big light when someone's committed to the build or broke the build, right? Um, when someone's closed a bug, I don't know, ring a gong, right? Like all these things are super accessible for you. Um, this is another thing that we got recently. Has anyone heard of AxiDraw? So pen plotters are making a big comeback. Um, Roland used to have pen plotters in the 70s and 80s that you'd have your felts and it would pick it up. So AxiDraw, you send it an image, 
from Inkscape, which is like a free version of Illustrator, and it will draw it out. And it does a great job of it. And you can switch out the pens. And so you can also program this remotely with a REST API. So you could create like the world's longest photo booth, right? Send it the image data, and it knows out how to draw. Um, if you're curious at all about electronics, uh, the art of electronics is probably, in my opinion, one of the things to pick up, and you're also going to have to invest because it's very costly, um, but it's that kind of great set of what's going on for electronics books. When you look at frameworks in JavaScript quickly, uh, Johnny5 is still one of my favorites if you're, gonna, if you're into Node, and it's really easy to get up and running and start working with an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi or any of those items. Um, and you can start playing with them, right, and go beyond that hello world of blinking an item. We gave a bunch of developers a bunch of Arduinos, and we had uh, a sumo bot competition, which is kind of funny. Think of two little robots in a sumo ring. First one to push the other one out, right? excited and it's like this tiny little ring but if you know even the least little bit of you know how to do any kind of coding it's totally approachable it's also a fun way to learn so if you don't know anything about it look node bots up see if there's a meetup near you um, we also explore different communication routes. And so I showed one of the developers Space Brew, which is something I really love. You can connect anything to anything almost. You have something running on Python over here, and you want to connect over here, and it's using Android. Um, it's the ability to kind of uh, connect and bridge those. And uh, I taught some people OSC protocol, so basically um, transmitting messages over OSC. And sometimes the easiest way to do something is the best. Someone's building out this crazy installation. I said, well, you could just download this app on your phone that you know, kind of broadcasts out the accelerometer data through OSC, and then you could just write something here. Don't worry about a Raspberry Pi here, and a Raspberry Pi here, and a Raspberry Pi here. Like, let's simplify. So we looked at something like that. When we look at bots, um, has anyone heard the term conversational UI? Conversational UI is like the new UX, right? And so this is smarter child. Bots can be really smart, but they can also be dumb. And this is one of the original bots uh, on AOL. Um, you know, obviously they're talking about their butt, so they want to talk about it again because they had stored that data. Um, but bots are making a way into Slack and Teams and Skype and everything you can imagine, uh, Messenger, Facebook. Um, and so when you look at bots, uh, you know, how fascinating is it that the White House chose to use bots on their uh, Facebook page so that you could go and talk with them? Or how about the personality of Doc from uh, Back to the Future, right? And so one of the things that we explore a lot is AI and bots, um, either using Messenger or we sometimes we'll use a Microsoft bot framework to get up and running. And you're starting to see AI as a service which is really cool, uh, you know, the ability to have a natural language processing as an endpoint where you can just send it something and it's going to tell you the sentiment, tell you the intention, uh, is really cool. And so, you know, we end up doing a lot of this with the machine learning, just training it and teaching it how to do things. Uh, machine learning is really big amongst artists right now because you'll see machine learning and artists, there's tons of courses you can take online. Some of the best people to follow, uh, Gene Kogan. Um, if you've ever been to this conference before, you'll know Mario Klingman. He's doing amazing things with machine learning for artists. Uh, you'll, Google has a whole initiative around it. Um, and so as an artist, there's a lot of opportunities for you to use that. A lot of people use Wekinator still to kind of do, uh, this has been around for a while. Um, you know, and they take this to simulate some of the machine learning. We built uh, a foosball, a couple of guys at work used machine learning to build the ultimate foosball um, competitor where they would train based on your input. So they would have a camera watching it, constantly training your moves. And the more you played against it, the better it got. And then they automated the other side with some electronics. Um, they blew up a lot of electronics, uh, not gonna lie. 
I'm going to flip through some of these quickly. Computer vision. Um, so computer vision, we have cognitive services, but there's a bunch of services out there where you can start to detect faces, ages, emotion, right? Um, you have, uh, for Microsoft, it's uh, cognitive services. For Google, it's the Cloud Vision API. Has anyone seen this? WebGazer, it's in the browser, right? Another kind of library that's starting to use those things. The other thing that we do is daily practice. And we start to look at people like Keith Peters, Bit 101, or Zach Lieberman, um, or uh, Jeff Gray, Grayfuse, and they put out every day a 15-minute sketch. You're constantly pumping that muscle um, that you have, and so often we'll do just coding or design challenges for 15 minutes a day. In terms of architecture, we look at painting apps, Kirigami, you know, or paper slicing, um, Pepecura, where you can take a model and it'll give you the paper output of it and you put it together. So we kind of look at all those things. So I guess when it comes to this is we add a bunch of tools or I add tools and an opportunity to play. I bring two things together they wouldn't expect, right? So let's look at uh, mixed reality and let's look at a physical object. Can you control the two? Let's look at AI and let's, you know, let's think about how you can use it in the browser, those kind of things. And so for us, this has probably been the most easiest way to get people engaged, but also continuously, continuously um, kind of trying new things, right? And seeing what fits. So, you know, some of that stuff, some takes, some doesn't, I guess, in the long run, right? Some of the stuff that doesn't, you drop. But exposing people to those things, I think, has been really valuable for us in order of creating greater technical curiosity. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to say thanks. There's a whole link for slides. We'll see that one more time. And I have a bunch of stuff up front. If you come quickly up front um, to give away, uh, so you can take some swag. I brought some swag. So I'm going to leave it at that. It's a long list, I know. Thank you.